Okay, hello everyone and uh, welcome to another installment of the UCLA Behavior Evolution and Culture Speakers Series. Uh, it's, it's that time again, Facebook might be down, but Beck is running full steam ahead. Uh, so I'm Brian Wood, I'm the organizer of this virtual space uh, for this academic year. Um, just to remind you all, we, we meet every Monday in the same place and uh, we will be continuing to be remote for the fall quarter. Uh, you can please go check out our website at beck.ucla.edu and there you'll see announcements for the future talks of the fall quarter, which are all posted right now. You can also find their links posted to recordings that have been made of prior presentations and which are hosted on our um, YouTube channel. And that YouTube channel will continue to be populated with talks this quarter. Uh, and today's talk, of course, will also be recorded. Uh, so before I introduce our, our speaker, I'd like to just give you a brief preview of next week. Next week, we're going to be joined by uh, Damien Cayo of UC Davis, um, a biological anthropologist and disease ecologist. Uh, his talk is entitled Behavioral Ecology, an Important Tool to Protect Threatened Gorilla Populations. So I uh, look forward to seeing uh, us all assembled again for that talk next week. So today, it's my great uh, pleasure to introduce a uh, former mentor and colleague of mine, uh, Jamie Jones. Um, he might not be my postdoc advisor currently, but he is still my mentor. <laughs> um, Jamie Jones at Stanford University. Um, he is uh, located in the Department of Earth System Science there. And so please, you can take yourself off mute if you would and uh, give Jamie a hearty welcome to Beck and he'll get started. All right, thanks. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, hmm. uh -oh. oh, that's interesting. Um, I don't see. There we go. Hopefully that'll work. You're seeing that? Yeah, we see your presenter view, so you might want to swap oh. displays. And yeah, uh, so this has never happened to me before. I, all right, take your time, no problem. Let's see. It didn't give me the option to share my second screen. I've if you never... slide your screen onto your primary monitor, sometimes that'll help. Just a thought. Okay. Uh, Wow. Okay. Let, let me, let me just try. I probably should have. I'm going to try one more time to share. Um, literally it's not there, but I see a one in the corner. What is that? That could be an indication of which is your monitor yeah so how do i switch monitors um all right well there's going to come a point at which i'm just going to have to wing it <laughs> um, no, you can within um within zoom do you see a, a swap display um that sometimes helps when I've been shuttled into presenter view. No, I don't. Oh, let, let's see. Hold shift. Uh, In Zoom under advanced, you can also just share a portion of the screen and you can drag a box so it only shows the slide that you'd like us to view and you'll still be able to view the rest of the screen. Well, shit. Um, I'm just gonna not do two screens here. Um, I'm plugging my other screen and 
And you don't have to worry. All of this will get edited out in post-production before Excellent. this goes live on YouTube. So oh, take fuck. your time, my all right, friend. There we go. All right. All right. There you are. Great. All right. So I have no notes, so I'm winging it. So hopefully that'll work out okay. Uh, I usually do wing it, but I found that I've, I've relied more on notes as we've moved into this Zoom world. All right. Well, thanks, Brian. I appreciate the offer. Uh, uh, hopefully I'll get over being rattled a little bit here. Um, and I'm going to talk about um, uh, today, I'm going to talk about some, some very new work, like really new work, like so new that I haven't really done much of it yet. But there are lots of ideas that I'm going to talk about. Um, and so we're going to talk about evolutionary dynamics under, under structural uncertainty uh, and the consequences for coupled diffusion processes. And by coupled diffusion processes, uh, what I mean by that, of course, is infectious disease transmission. Um, so, um, I typically wear two hats and, uh, you know, there, there's evolutionary demography and disease ecology and depending on which community I'm dealing with, they, they often don't know that I do the one or the other. Probably not the most effective professional strategy, but it's the, the way I've done it for a while. Um, and uh, in general, I haven't done much where I've brought the two, the two hats together. Um, an exception being a paper a couple of years ago with Jess Metcalf, where we looked at optimal duration of, of maternal immunity and perhaps not surprisingly, what we find is that longer lived organisms, the optimal duration of maternal, maternally derived immunity is longer. Um, but there are some really interesting trade offs uh, that we elucidated. And in particular, you don't want, um, you don't want to uh, have maternally derived immunity for too long because then your offspring lose the ability to, to transmit durable immunity to their own offspring. So there, there's some interesting intergenerational transfer uh, uh, trade-offs there. Um, but other than that, that's kind of what the only exa example of bringing these two, these two worlds together. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is a much greater integration of life history theory and, and the way I've sort of taken it um, into uh, thinking about evolutionary economics and decision theory uh, and, and infectious disease dynamics. Um, so let's flash back to, say, around December 2019. Uh, the the two-hat metaphor applies pretty well. I'm working on some stuff with former grad student uh, SFI postdoc Mike Price on you know what we we call broadly evolutionary uh, evolution evolutionary economics. We're looking at, at decision rules and the evolution of decision rules and and looking at how uh, evolving agents uh, should make decisions. And one of the really interesting things that comes out of this is that it looks an awful lot like the way that economists complain about how irrational people are that making say for example in this case using nonlinear probability weighting to make your economic decisions is actually what arises from selection um, uh, of agents in, in, in an environment over time. Um, so we're, we're working on that. And importantly, I'm working on a trade publication that I've been working on for a little while that's on risk management and human evolution. And dare I say it, human rationality. It's, it's, a, it's a rough time to talk about rationality for a variety of reasons. Um, but in the book, you know, I, I focus, not surprisingly, uh, pr primarily on evolutionary uh, objective functions and, and use a lot of examples from the ethnographic record and thinking about the, the remarkable uh, adaptation and adaptability of people living in subsistence populations and the, and the very sensible decisions they make about subsistence and reproduction. Um, and so there's that hat, right? And then Again, we're still in December 2019. I'm working with a group mostly at UCSF and, and uh, at Harvard. And we're try we were trying to come up with sort of clever contact tracing and, and uh, vaccination strategies, network-based vaccination strategies for Ebola virus disease in Sierra, Sierra Leone. And we have, we have ongoing field work in Sierra Leone where we're gathering information on contact networks and a variety of different multiplex networks and, and trying to think how we can find cases and, and optimally vaccinate for uh, in anticipation of the next outbreak of Ebola virus disease in West Africa. So 
<laughs> but then came COVID, right? December 19, 2019, we're moving into the new year. And as the images of the, the emerging pandemic came in, particularly from the United States, it became increasingly untenable for me to be thinking about two things, right? One is, is it's, it's tough to be working on a book on human rationality where you're pro-rationality, where you're arguing in favor that people are generally make pretty decent decisions when you're seeing the sort of things that we were seeing and we continue to see with the epidemic. Um, and at the same time, it makes it hard to work on, you know, these sort of clever network based tweaks to optimal vaccination strategies when it turns out that large segments of the population don't even believe that the disease is real. They don't want they don't want a vaccine in the first place. There's nothing there, there's no sort of marginal benefit to coming up with a slightly better vaccination algorithm when 40 percent of your population refuses to get vaccinated. And this caused me. A, a bit of a moment of crisis and and like many people uh, who who work in infectious disease uh, ecology I felt compelled to make a contribution but of course a lot of the contributions were honestly kind of kind of half asked uh, and and so th this got me into the space of thinking what can I actually do that's that's uh, that's interesting that's important that's maybe unique um, so I just want to draw your attention to this is an XKCD comic, obviously from from May of 2020. Randall Monroe points out right that that you know there's amazing unanimity in in nationally representative polls that, that most people in May of 2020 believed that public health measures were sensible things to do. They agreed with a statement that stay at home orders are responsible government policies that are saving lives rather than an overreaction. And just for, for uh, comparison's sake, right? Only 75% of Americans believe that the earth rotates around the sun, right? So 86% of Americans agreeing on anything is kind of amazing. And, and these numbers, you know, these numbers are, are, are largely across the board at this time, but there's something about humans getting together, right? You can be individually quite sensible. I'll, I'll avoid calling them rational. They can be quite sensible, but you put people together and you you get some some pretty crazy behavior. And I, I don't need to tell this audience that. Um, we see the the organized protests, the 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 uh, the collective action working against the pandemic, and of course, you know the the result of protesting the pandemic and, and protesting public health um, interventions and public health control is that you prolong the pandemic, right? You make it worse in the, in the long run. Um, and you, of course, then have more to, uh, to complain about. So uh, for me, the, the interest has, has started to focus on how can we go from individual people making pretty good decisions by and large and, and when they they get into groups uh it leads to what seems like extremely peculiar behavior uh from an adaptive framework um and this has gotten me uh, there's so many notes on the slide hopefully I, I, i'm covering them um hopefully uh yeah that, that's that's moved me into this this realm of of cultural evolutionary models, uh, something that I've never really worked on before, wrote one paper in 2008 on. Um, and so this is a big pivot for me. Uh, and, and so, uh, and this is probably not, you know, a great insight to anyone, but uh, I, I realized, you know, we use the term pivotal, right, to mean like important. And I was like, oh, pivotal, I'm pivoting. I'm in the process of, this is a pivotal moment for me as I pivot, as I pivot to working on more cultural evolutionary models, uh, thinking about infectious disease, uh, transmission dynamics, but but some other things as well. Uh, you know, I'm not going to talk about it today, but we're, we're really interested in, in thinking about climate change and, and both adaptation and mitigation to to uh, the, the worst outcomes related to climate change. Um, so that's kind of always in the back of my mind, too. So all right, with that as a big, long winded introduction, uh, let me, I'm going to, my talk is going to fall into three broad uh, 
uh, segments. I want to talk about the fundamental importance of uncertainty for understanding human life histories, decision making, and cultural evolution. Um, and so I'm going to spend a little bit of time on that. Uh, I also want to talk about cultural transmission under uncertainty. And this is something, so uncertainty in general has been understudied. Uh, uncertainty in, in evolution uh, has been extremely understudied. People use the term, but they don't, they don't actually mean what we mean technically when, uh, when there's, there's actual structural uncertainty, and I'll explain what that means in a second. So uh, I'll talk about cultural transmission a little bit. Uh, under uncertainty and, and what and more interestingly what the aggregate consequences of using the social heuristics, which is a way of dealing with uncertainty. Uh, what those consequences are and then i'm going to present some some work that Paul Smaldino and I have been working on and that we're expanding at this very moment. Um, looking at transmission dynamics for what we call coupled contagion models, so these are contagion models where you have cultural ideas that that may that affect the transmission of the infectious disease. They may be adaptive things like wearing a mask or, or getting vaccinated. They may be maladaptive things and they and they feed back on each other. The dynamics of the infectious disease feed back on the cultural adoption and vice versa. And what what emerges are fairly complex dynamics. Um, we have a very simple model that I'm going to talk to you about today that remarkably reproduces some of the qualitative features of the of the American experience of, of the pandemic of of the SARS coronavirus too. So um, and then I'll talk about where we're going with this after that. So let's jump into it. This cheery fellow uh, is Frank Knight, the father of the Chicago School of Economics, and. Uh, and let's see if I can read this. Uh, you know, it's a long quote, but just at the end, it, it, it will appear that a measurable uncertainty or risk proper, as we shall use the term, is so far different from an unmeasurable one that it is not in effect an uncertainty at all. And so Knight is, is the, the person who, who makes this fundamental distinction originally in 1921 between risk and uncertainty. And, and the, the essence of the difference between risk and uncertainty is, is that risk is a variable outcome where you have measurable probabilities. Uh, and, and it turns out to be pretty straightforward to figure out what the best decision to make under risk when you have known probabilities are. Uncertainty means that you have a variable outcome, but you don't know the, the probabilities of the different outcomes. And in fact, and this, this really gets at this, this notion of what's now called Knightian uncertainty. You may not even know the outcome space, right? You are, you are in a fundamental existential sense, state of uncertainty when, when we're talking about uncertainty. And interestingly, there was clearly a zeitgeist in 1921. Knight writes his, his book, Risk, Uncertainty, and Profit, and, and John Maynard Keynes in the UK writes his treatise on, on probability at the same time. And, and Keynes um, uh, focused enormously, like in a, a great deal on uncertainty and, and uncertainty's effects on markets and uncertainty's effects on, on development and, and, and economic growth. And one of the interesting things about uncertainty, right, if you can't measure it, if you can't even specify the space, it makes, you can imagine, this makes it very difficult to write down a formal model of uncertainty. And so the treatment of uncertainty has tended to uh, to be alighted on the one hand and, and, um, and collapsed into thinking about risk and measurable risks. And one of the big criticisms of Keynes in his lifetime uh, and beyond was that he was not as mathematical as, as a, an economist should be, right? And part of the reason for that is he felt like you couldn't really uh, encapsulate these ideas of uncertainty in a mathematical model. And the people who formalized a lot of Keynesian ideas, John Hicks is a, is a great example, you know, actually just ignored the, the uncertainty part. They, they focused on the aggregate demand models uh, and, and got rid of the uncertainty. And so I, I think that Keynes would not actually recognize uh, the, the, the things that are called Keynesian sort of after his, his untimely death in, in 1946. So that's uncertainty. Um, and it's hard 
to model, but I'm going to present with, there, there are some, some nice new tools. They're, they're a little, uh, some of the tools are, are pretty rough going. Um, and Mike Price and I are working on writing a review paper right now for evolutionary human sciences that brings in some of these mathematical tools from decision theory that deal with, with, um, uh, with uh, uh, uncertainty, making decisions under uncertainty. And so we hope that that will be useful for an evolutionary anthropo anthropological audience. Um, but what I'm going to focus on here is a, a probabilistic representation of uncertainty, okay? And, and it has to do with the tails of probability distributions. These are fat-tailed dwarf lemurs. They, uh, they store fat in their tails before the Malagas dry season in order to help them withstand the, the, the extreme events that may happen, the tail events that may happen in their environments. Um, and we're going to focus on, on fat tails as a representation for this type of Nydian uncertainty. Um, it's an approximation. So here is, uh, suppose you have a decision to make, right? You, you want to know something about, you know, the, the, the foraging returns to a particular new technology that you've employed in, in, uh, in your, your foraging regime. And you, you want to, uh, you know, you need to learn about it. This is a new, this is a, a new phenomenon and, and you don't know anything about it. You're, you're completely ignorant to start off with. The way we represent complete ignorance is a uniform distribution that is, that spans the real line, right? It goes from negative infinity to infinity. This, it has to integrate to one, which means that it's infinitesimally high, but you know, we can, we can look at a little snapshot of it. And what we see is this, is this line that, that, that tells us that every possible outcome is equally probable. All right. We don't really think that that happens very often, but just taking that as our basis, right? As you start to learn about the outcomes, you're trying to choose, say, between two different, um, two different behaviors and, and, and we're focusing on, on the outcomes that come from one of these behaviors. As you observe values, if it's, well, if it's a well-behaved situation, you're going to have values accumulating in the middle and you're going to see an absence of things at, at, at the ends. I'm, I'm focusing on something that's, that's, um, uh, that's, um, uh, sorry, the word is symmetrical, <laughs> symmetrical here. Uh, it doesn't need to be, you could be trying to learn about something that's, that's skewed or, and, or, you know, is, has, is constrained to be greater than zero, whatever. People seem to get bell-shaped distribution, so I'm going to focus on a normal distribution here. So you're observing things in the middle, you're not observing things on the tail, as you as you add experience, right, you're going to get a distribution that looks something like this. You're going to continue to make observations of where the values in, in nature actually lie and where they don't. And and ultimately, you're going to have if if this is something that, that can be learned about, you're going to have a, a re reasonably precise uh, distribution that looks something like this. Um, now, obviously, if we if if this is actually a deterministic universe, there's a single true value. If we kept learning long enough, we could crunch this this distribution down to a, a, a single point mass, right? A, a line that's a vertical line at the at the true value. And so those are our, that's kind of this, our space, right? Complete ignorance is a horizontal line. Complete certainty is a, is a vertical line. Reality is is always in between. But, you know, we have this nice normal distribution that looks something like this. Let me drop this on top of here. This is what's called a Cokey distribution. And it's a, it's a very peculiar, mathematically peculiar distribution. Um, but what I want to draw your attention to in particular are the tails here. Because you, you see that, I mean, they're scaled in such a way that the, that the, that the central values are the same. Uh, the Cokey, actually, the, the expected value of the mean is not defined. But it has a mode at the same place that this normal distribution has a mode. Um, but in the tails, you see that the, the probability of an extreme event decays much slower than it does in our, our normal case, right? And we can look at a ratio of, if, if we plot this against the standard deviation, uh, the ratio of this, this Cokey tail to the, to the normal tail it looks uh, something like this, and and you know these are huge values. 
that's driven by the fact that the normal distribution basically goes to zero probability for very high values. But you know, we can we can look more closely at the tails themselves. Um, when you get out to about four standard deviations, right, the normal distribution, the probability is essentially zero. Whereas at six standard deviations, this Cokie distribution uh, still has a, a probability of 1%. So if we're imagining that this is something that, that, you know, these are annual probabilities of something, that's one in every century, right? As we go out to nine, we still have half a percent. Um, and as we get out to 10 standard deviations, away from our, our, our center, we still have uh, three tenths of a, of a percent. So that's like once every about 350 years, which is 13 human generations, right? So these fat tail distributions have real consequences over ecological, let alone uh, evolutionary time. Um, so, but why, why should we care about them? Um, there are some people, frankly, who treat uh, fat tail distributions with a slightly metaphysical uh, awe that they that they they naturally exist in all sorts of uh, in all sorts of things in the world without really any evidence. Um, and I've actually been quite critical in, if I'm not mistaken, the last time I gave a Beck talk, which was a long time ago, uh, I talked about my skepticism of heavy tail distributions uh, of of sexual uh, uh, sexual networks. Um, and, and today I'm, I'm much more credulous and I'll, I'll explain why I'm more credulous because there's a, there's a case where fat tail distributions absolutely are a real thing that, that uh, exist in, if not in the world, in the heads of decision makers. All right. So yeah, many biophysical phenomena are characterized by heavy tail distributions. Uh, a couple of just examples and, and you know, this is, this is curve fitting, right? Distribution fitting. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that the that the stochastic process generating these data is is correct correctly specified, but you know one day rainfall maximum maxima follow Cokie distributions pretty well. Energy dissipation and cyclones follow power law. Power law is like the canonical model with po polynomial decay of the probability in the t in the tail. And so yeah, that exists. More interesting is that prediction from finite sample learning leads to heavy tailed distributions of beliefs. This is real, all right? And I'll, I'll show you this in, in a second. And one of the consequences of this is that heavy tails can destroy cost-benefit analysis. Any sort of economic cost-benefit analysis, they destroy expected utility in particular, right? The, 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 the fundamental kernel of rational choice theory is destroyed by heavy tailed distributions. And so we're gonna talk briefly, this is Bruno Di Finetti, uh, who along with Frank Ramsey, the Jimi Hendrix of economics, um, died when he was 26, like had huge impacts on multiple fields, philosophy, economics, mathematics. Um, but Bruno Di Finetti uh, and, and Ramsey pointed out that, a, an op, that a, a rational agent will update their information uh, using Bayesian updating, they will take their existing prior distribution and they will update it in a Bayesian way to construct a, a, a posterior distribution. This is, a, this is another core element of the rational choice uh, theory. Uh, and the reason that you want to be a Bayesian in your updating is so that you can avoid the Dutch book problem. The Dutch book problem is, uh, is a, a, a situation where you have a, a certain to lose bet. Okay, and you don't want to take a bet that you're certain to lose. That's what's known, maybe a little racistly, as as uh, as the Dutch book problem. There's a Dutch book, Dan Ariely, translation of, of predictably irrational into Dutch. Uh, I think it's hilarious. No one has ever laughed at that joke, though. What am I going to do? All right. So there's a slightly obscure paper in 2001 by uh, the economist John Gawecki who was at the University of Iowa, good, you know, agricultural economist. Uh, and you may recognize him as, uh, no, I don't have it, but he was one of the, he was, he was a, um, a Don Rubin student, uh, I believe, or, or an acolyte in the, in the sort of Bayesian data analysis world uh, that came out of, of that group with, with you know, um, Andrew Gelman and, and, and Carlin and those guys. Anyways, Gawecki, 
wrote a brief paper in Economics Letters in 2001, three pages long, in which he pointed out that uh, if you're a, a rational Bayesian agent and you're doing your updating, right, and say you, you're, you're working on a normal uh, distrib a normally distributed outcome, if you know the variance, then what you have is a very nice Bayesian conjugate model where the posterior distribution after you've you've done your learning is also normally distributed, right? And and the the variance. I mean, this is classic sampling theory, right? The, the variance is related to uh, to the sample size, and the variance goes down, or your precision goes up as your sample size increases. Okay. However, we don't know. Nature has not told us what the variance is on anything that we want to make a, a decision about, right? So we have to use a model. Presumably, there's some you know sort of cognitive machinery that, that can do this sort of thing uh, that that involves estimating the variance as well. And what happens when you estimate the variance? Well, the marginal distribution of this Bayesian conjugate model for a normal mean turns out to be a t distribution, and a t distribution has heavy tails. Okay, and and the and the t distribution for among other things the moment distribution function is not defined and what that means is that expected utility cannot be calculated when your 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 uncertainty is represented by a t distribution this is a very simple model this is just estimating a normal mean and it is broken by the the inclusion of uncertainty right the reason we get these heavy tails is because we have to integrate our model for the mean across the, the uncertainty of the variance, and that fattens out the tails. That makes them more like that. The tails become more like that uniform distribution. They're much flatter. Okay, Martin Weitzman, the late economist from Harvard and, and climate economist, uh, has talked about this a, a, a great deal, talked about Goecki's model and and uh, has noted that it essentially breaks expected utility theory and in particular uh, any sort of cost benefit calculation that one might do for the far future um, and i'll spare you the moment generating distributions and all that stuff but i'll talk about something that is simultaneously i think easier it's easier for me to get my brain around um, but it also it, i think in, encapsulates some interesting life history theory so this here is uh, what's known as the extended Ramsey equation. That's the, it's the same Ramsey who is the Jimi Hendrix of economics. Um, and uh, rho on the left-hand side is the, uh, the, the discount rate, right? It's, it's a measure of your time preference. When rho is high, uh, you much prefer consumption in the immediate present to the, the future and your preference for things in the far future will be basically zero if, if rho is high enough, okay? Um, this is, I'll just point out, this is a special case of the Ramsey equation that makes it very neat to look at. Um, and so there, there are advantages to that. This is assuming that, um, that consumption is not log normally distributed, distributed and that your, your utility function takes the, the constant relative risk aversion uh, form but there is a more general Ramsey equation. It just doesn't look as pretty. Uh, what are the elements of it? We've got the discount rate, right? That's your measure of time preference. You've got this delta is the, the rate of pure time preference. This is just your psychological uh, uh, preference for immediate consumption versus later consumption. Eta is what's called the elasticity of intertemporal substitution. So it basically tells you um, how, uh, how much of a decrement you're going to have if you delay your um, your consumption. R is the growth rate of the population. And in the standard Ramsey formulation, this is the, the growth rate of the economy. Um, and then finally, S, S squared is the variance in the growth rate. All right, and um, here's, here's where you can actually see, and this is, this is Weitzman's uh, point of this. Um, the sign on the second term, this variance term, is negative, right? Even if you don't have a heavy tail, right? So, so say you have, you know, a low degree of freedom t, t, a t distribution or a Cauchy distribution or something like that with infinite variance, right? That obviously means 
that your your time preferences in the, in the sort of standard time separable framework just don't work right but even if it's a more well behaved variance it's just high right it's the, the 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 maybe the coefficient of variation is high that your variance is high relative to your mean right then this is going to have wreak havoc on your sort of standard expectations for time preference and, and it's actually quite quite straightforward to uh, induce negative time preferences, um, which you know the economists have a hard time with. I, I'm not so sure that's a bad thing, but that's another conversation altogether. Uh, I mentioned that there's some interesting life history theory in this. Suppose you know the economists typically do this in terms of the growth of the economy, but we could we could do R to be uh, the intrinsic rate of increase, the fitness measure in, a, in an age structured population, right? And and what is this telling us? It's telling us uh, two things. One, that the demographic effects are always going to push your discount rate higher, right? Population growth means that if I delay my reproduction from now when the population size is N to some time in the future, T, right, then the population has grown by, and it's bigger, right? It's, it's, it's N times E to the RT um, in T years in the future. All right, and so a higher R, a higher growth rate, means that you you always want uh, to discount steeper. All right. On the other hand, pushing in the other direction are the environmental effects. If you have uh, an unpredictable, uncertain environment, okay, you then selection is going to actually push you to spread out your reproduction. It's the classic bet hedging scenario that I've, I've argued for being the fundamental feature of, of, the, of human reproductive biology, right? That you want to spread out your reproduction. You don't want to concentrate it early in life, right? You want, to, you want to have multiple bouts of reproduction over a longer span. You hope you get lucky a couple times. This is a classic diversification strategy, all right? So that's there and it just contained right in this, in this Ramsey, this extended Ramsey equation. What's delta? I think that this is actually a really interesting possibility here, uh, thinking about uh, Harpending and Draper and, and observations of, you know, how do early life events affect people's preferences for, and, and their, their life cycle preferences for reproduction. Uh, I, I, I could imagine building that into Delta quite easily. And so this is a paper that hopefully will be submitted pretty soon. It's actually a little bit of a, 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 a side branch here. Um, back to cultural evolution. The point here, right, is that expected utility theory and just basic cost benefit analysis, particularly over intertemporal uh, uh, options, are not viable uh, decision criteria under uncertainty. We have to use something different, right? And, and this suggests that the, the, the types of, of, of heuristics that Gerd Gigerenzer suggests right that that the types of of social learning heuristics that um cultural evolutionists have talked about are really what the name of the game is when it comes to making decisions under uh under uncertainty all right so uh we've got a lot of 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 grants submitted right now this is a big one um, with a, a, a multidisciplinary group some people you guys probably know paul smaldino and christina moya but this is margaret levy who's the director of the center for advanced study in the behavioral sciences here up on the hill uh, thomas Bordeaux is a philosopher of biology at the university of bordeaux, bordeaux. abby rumsey is a, a historian who who works on the preservation of of historical sources over time Peter Lowen is a, a political scientist in, in Canada who, uh, in, at the University of Toronto who works on, on the persistence of political institutions. Matt Turner is a, a postdoc who did his PhD with, with uh, Paul, who's uh, working on this project right now. We just got a little bit of funding and we're, we're, we're shooting the moon on a big funding project. I'm looking on at uncertainty and existential threats like novel pandemics and climate change. Um, so. Let's talk about my take on uh, cultural evolution. Oh my God, there's so many notes here. Hopefully I'll get it right. Um, <laughs> uh, cultural evolution needs social interaction. So the, the, the dominant approach to, to models of cultural evolution is borrowed for, from population genetics. And, and you, know, you develop these discrete time recursions with non-overlapping generations of 
um, that the you know the, the the probability of adoption or the frequency of adoption in, in generation T plus one is a function of its of its of its its commonness its prevalence in generation T, um, and we've we've we have lots of fantastic work uh, that has been generated by that approach. The problem with that is uh, a, a couplefold. Um, one of them it has to do with it's it's harder to build in social structure uh, into into uh, that population genetics uh, uh, framework. And one of the things that's in my notes that I can't access is a quote from uh, Mark Feldman and, and Luca Cavalli Sforza, who sort of um, pioneered this population genetics approach. And in their monograph from 1990, uh, 1981, uh, Luca and Mark note that they're going to use a population genetics framework, these discrete time recursions. A potentially uh, better framework might be that of an epidemic model. All right. And, uh, and the thing about epidemic models, and I, I agree with this, the thing about epidemic models is that they, they naturally allow structure to be built in very easily. Another really important feature of epidemic models, like if we think about an, like an epidemic model for something like tuberculosis, you can build in dynamics at multiple different scales. Tuberculosis has fast, fast and slow dynamics. Culture change has fast and slow dynamics as well. We have the, the broad change of the American populace, and we have the rapid change of behavior under a pandemic, for example. Those are very hard to address using the sort of standard tools that we use in, in uh, cultural evolutionary models. Uh, and Paul and Christina and I are, are particularly interested in that, are particularly interested in uh, social structure, social identity, and its effects on, on behavior change. And so we're, uh, we're advocating and, and helping to develop cultural evolutionary models uh, that are, are represented more as, as, uh, as epidemic models. Uh, and I'll just note that, you know, in, when you have a structured epidemic model in the limit, as you, you, you get, dig deeper and deeper down into the social structure, what you're left with is a, is a network, right? And so we have, uh, we, can, we can look at this at various different levels of social organization, all the way down to the network diffusion uh, models. All right, so that's my my take on social, uh, but we need to we need to think carefully about how we incorporate things like selection. Some of the classic, um, and it's not it's not hard, but it's something that that hasn't been done. If we look at, at uh, areas of science that have used diffusion models um, uh, for for uh, culture change and behavior change, they haven't focused as much on the selective dynamics, um, and so that's something that we're we're looking to build into this. All right. So uncertainty activates social heuristics. This is at least we think, right? Um, and so uh, 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 the, the sort of classic example of this is that when, when you're faced with a decision and under uncertainty, what do you do? You imitate the majority, right? You, you, you engage or, or you, you imitate the most, maybe it's a plurality, but you, know, you, you, you adopt disproportionately the most common behavior. This is conformist bias, um, and it's it's been suggested that this is a, a fundamental feature uh, that, that that people engage in uh, under uncertainty. the The problem with it is that the the evidence, on, both theoretically and empirically, is a little bit mixed. You know, that there's a very strong intuition, um, but uh, and and I share that intuition, but I. I, I'm not convinced that we have the, you know, the sort of smoking gun on this. And this is something that we're focused on um, uh, with this work going forward. Um, you know, so, so we have obviously uh, Rob Boyd and Pete, Pete Richardson um, talking about con the, the importance of conformist bias, and they have a nice model of a space, spatially heterogeneous mo uh, landscape where you know the the best the best play is essentially to imitate um, what's the majority in the patch that you find yourself in following dispersal, and then of course Rob and, and Joe Henrik have have argued a little more forcefully for the the general usefulness of conformist bias. Um, there are other there are other social be, uh, uh, processes that can resemble 
uh, conformist bias that might, you know, be uh, equally useful. Um, but I'll save that for later. Um, I, I was going to talk also about error management theory. I think it's really a, a, a really interesting idea, and I have a bunch of, of tables of laying out costs and benefits under error, error management theory, but I'm, I'm going to just um, sort of skip over that in the interest of time um, and talk about, you know, so, so the idea of error management theory, right, is that false negatives, false, false positives when making a decision when your prediction of the world is it goes against the um, the state of the world, right? These can have very asymmetric, very different costs. Um, and so the, to the extent that I will talk about error management theory, I will say that what are the least costly errors over, over evolutionary time? They're typically uh, imitating not just the, any majority, but the majority of the people who you associate with and you share, for example, ethnic markers, uh, spatial proximity, right, you know, regular habitus, right? And so we can we can think about a random association looking something like this, and, and a homophilus is a term that isn't used much, I guess, in the in the in the evolutionary sciences, but it's a big big thing in in uh, uh, sociology, right? So we we have homophilus association, so people associating with people who are like themselves. Right and and there, uh, the intuition is quite strong. I think that that uh, you know learning from people who you spend all your time with and you interact with and and for whom you you are engaged in various probable social contracts is probably a safe thing to do over evolutionary time. Uh, unfortunately, I think it might run in, run into some problems in the types of societies we live in right now. So there's been quite a bit of work on. Um, I have no idea what my time is. I'm running out of time, aren't I? Uh, no, you're okay. It's 12.47, so you have, think about it like 15 to 20 minutes or so. 15 to 20 minutes of talking. Any any time amount between basically now okay. and the end, yeah, don't, yeah, yeah. don't, don't I'll, sweat I'll it. Try to, I'll try to go pretty fast through this uh, because I, I would like to have some, some conversations too. Great. Um, there's been quite a bit of work on homophily and, and adoption that's gone on in various sort of com uh, the various literatures that think about uh, uh, culture change and adoption. Uh, Sinal Aral, uh, Sinan Aral shows that 50% of contagion attributable to, is attributable to homophily in behavior adoption in a natural experiment. Uh, Damon Santola has shown that uh, adoption of health behaviors increased is increased by homophily in, in a behavior change experiment that he performed. Uh, Nicole Crianza has this terrific paper with Mark Feldman in 2014 showing that the trait selective advantage need not be as high uh, for the adoption of a novel trait when it's transmitted assortatively, homophilously, by its bearers. Um, and then Ben Golub and, and Matt Jackson you know, show that homophily slows convergence to the best responses in strategic networks. This is a really interesting one, right? That that when you play like your the the people you associate with, you share ethnic markers with, you aren't as responsive to changes in the environment, and you you can actually lose out on on payoffs, economic payoffs in their case. Um, so we have a, a rapid grant through that uh, addressed um, a bunch of uh, uh, theoretical and empirical questions on the COVID pandemic. Um, and here are the, the co-PIs, Christina Paul, Michelle Klein, another UCLA person, Zach Almquist is a sociologist and a statistician at the University of Washington, and Ashley Hazel was a research scientist here at Stanford, and she's moved up to the epidemiology department at UCSF. Um, and uh, we have two elements to this, this work. One is, is empirical. We have a nationally representative sample uh, survey. Uh, um, longitudinal panel survey. We've looked at people's uh, beliefs about the pandemic and, and a whole bunch of questions about their, their uh, political beliefs, their, their, uh, their neighborhood associations, their, their integration uh, in their populations. And these data are just in. We just finished our third wave and are starting the analysis right now. Unfortunately, I don't have anything to share with you. It's so new. Um, 
but we do have theoretical work that's that's built on this this notion of a coupled contagion process. And I'll just point out one other big grant. Brian and I were just talking about this before we started. Uh, this is the Predictive Intelligence and Pandemic Preparedness with my colleagues from the the first round of PIP, Vivek, Maya, Juliet, myself. We have just put in a big planning grant for what we hope will be. Uh, a center for epidemic modeling that is informed by social science and cultural evolution. We'll see if anyone at NSF buys that, but those are those are our, our plans, and that was literally submitted on Friday. Um, so it's been a busy grant time for me. All right, so let's look at the at this this coupled contagion model. I'm going to show you one coupled contagion model and then talk about how we're going to push this into the future. Um, so we're going to look at when public health compliance becomes cultural identity. We have a model of uh, where uh, it's just a standard, uh, very simple epidemic model. It's an SIR model, susceptible, infectious, recovered or removed, depending on how morbid you are. Right. And, and the, our population is, is our, our epidemic population is structured into two subgroups. We have, on the one hand, careful people who've adopted uh, a, an adaptive protective behavior like mask wearing, for example, right? And then we have an uncareful population. And so we have SIR dynamics within these two. They interact with each other, right? So, so careful people who get infected can infect uncareful and vice versa. But also, and this is important, our adoption dynamics, you can you can move back and forth between states, right? So the, it, it, it's technically what, what we would call an SI model, susceptible infectious, or an SIS model. You become susceptible again as soon as you drop the behavior, okay? So, um, um, so we've got this structured model uh, with, with the possibility of learning this adaptive behavior that reduces transmissibility. Um, but we add a twist of that, all right? And our twist is group identity as well so we've got the the two you have these two different states that you can be in you can be careful or you can be uncareful but we also have a group identity that structures our, our population and in addition to homophily your tendency to imitate people who are like you we've added to the mix a very potentially very strong um out group aversion and this is a a, a picture oh, sorry this is a picture taken from the uh, white nationalist counter protest to in Huntington Beach last summer uh, to a Black Lives Matter uh, march. And this, this really encapsulates the type of outgroup aversion uh, that we're seeing in the streets not too far from our fancy universities, at least you guys, not so much in NorCal. Although, I mean, if you go far enough north, for sure. <laughs> um, all right. And Importantly, you know, a structural feature of this is despite the fact that your behavior might be driven largely by your avoidance of other people who, who think differently than you or your, uh, your in-group, there's still the possibility we live in a mixed population. So this gentleman having a nice nap with his eye, with his eye shade uh, on the plane, right, he still has to interact with, with people who are wearing masks, right? And so that you're not separated it completely into two different worlds in these models, right? And so we have our, our kettlebell model of association, right? You you have you have uh, your homophily, uh, your probability W sub I as to whether you you interact with people like you, uh, and then we have a, a, a an outgroup aversion parameter that's that's built into our learning model, we call it gamma. And what do we get? So here is the effect of homophily and outgroup aversion on behavior adoption. And as we crank up our outgroup aversion, what we see is we, we, we go from you know, qualitatively similar adoption dynamics, just separated in time a little bit, uh, into a, a broader separation. We can plot, and this is in fact a proper bifurcation, we can plot, make the bifurcation diagram here. Or here, rather than plotting against time, we're, we're plotting against the equilibrium adoption rate against outgroup aversion. And what we see is that as we crank up outgroup aversion, we hit a critical juncture where we have a bifurcation. 
And we basically have two groups, one who is almost completely adopted and one who is almost completely unadopted. Uh, so that was interesting in and of itself. But now what we do is we, we add on to this a, a coupled diffusion process. And that diffusion process is our, our, the transmission dynamics of our pathogen. Uh, yep, there's our bifurcation. And we get a wide range of, of behavior, okay? And with, without outgroup aversion, when gamma is equal to zero, that's the top row here, or the, 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 first, the first two, well, well, this panel over here. And what we see is that we get these, we, these different peaks uh, with a little bit of time separation, depending on how intense the, um, the homophily is, but we don't get really dramatic differences. As soon as we add uh, a modest degree of, of outgroup aversion, and bear in mind this is, this is below the, that, that uh, bifurcation point, we get a wide range of, of, of different types of, of epidemics in the subgroups. And the one I really want to draw your attention to is this, this bottom one, and I'll, I'll blow it up so that we can look at it a little more. So what we have here, and we, we've plotted in gray, the uh, adoption dynamics um, of, uh, so this is the proportion adopted, and you can see that group one is very nearly gone to fixation in, uh, in a fairly short period of time. The epidemic starts in group one, and what happens? They adopt this adaptive behavior rapidly, and what it does is it reduces the, the, the reproduction number of the pathogen of the epidemic down below uh, the, the, this, this epidemic level, and we get essentially a, a degree of endemic transmission, right? If, if, if they were in, in a population by themselves, the, the epidemic would go away. But because there's back transmission from this other group that has a very rapid exponential increase in, in uh, infections, uh, it, it persists in a, in a sort of like quasi-endemic state here, all right? So, Initial outbreak in group, uh, sorry, initial outgroup in group one, echo, uh, adaptation, echo in group two, group two does not adopt the protective behavior, they get a big, a big spike, they start to adopt it at sort of lower fractions, the, 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 the dynamics uh, naturally start to come down, we get a little bit of an echo here in group one, right, because the, the outgroup aversion goes in in both directions as they start to adopt more. Um, but they're also just a, there's a greater susceptible population in group one. This looks qualitatively an awful lot like what's happened in the United States, right? We get this early, uh, the, these early urban coastal epidemics. We get this, this national discourse that, that's, that's driven from the top, frankly, that you know, this is a disease of urban people. That this is not something that 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 rural America needs to worry about. Um, and we get the the types of bizarre group interactions that we've seen over the last eighteen months or so, or maybe is it more now? Whatever it's been, a long time, too long. Um, and we get this big echo in the second group that is the non-adopting, the non-adaptive group. So um, this is a very simple model that gives us these what what we see paul and i see as being qualitatively very similar results to what we've actually seen in the united states and so we feel like uh with this as a sort of foundation we're on to something uh interesting with this coupled contagion approach um that's what i'm going to present for this model i want to talk about where we're going and i'll be quick about it so we can have a little bit of of conversation um We've got a simulation platform. It's been three weeks. The, the, the grant has, has been going for three weeks. I was hoping to have some results to show, but it's, it's too complicated. Uh, we don't have anything really worth showing. The simulation platform is written in Julia, which is fun learning a new language. And Julia is really cool. It's super fast uh, and it's quite easy to learn. I think it's easier than Python. Uh, and it's really easy for those of you who are R users, it's really easy to translate your R code directly to Julia. So if you want to mock it up in R and then translate it to Julia for speed, that's a pretty good workflow. I, I, I've got to recommend it. 
uh, our simulation platform. So this isn't, we're just looking at a single uh, experiment. What we're do doing is trying to develop this, this environment, this platform that we can conduct multiple experiments in both, you know, sort of like uh, trying to understand best responses to uncertainty, but also in, in this coupled contagion framework and, the, and this cultural evolution under uncertainty. So we can build in from the outset heterogeneous multi-group populations, complex societies like we live in, or something more closely approximating complex societies. Uh, the sort of standard um, uh, cultural evolutionary models are, are, are in very simple societies. And we, we have this heterogeneity. We're pretty sure the heterogeneity drives some of the dynamics. We're building that into our framework. Uh, we've got endogenous identity formation in, in our uh, evolution and human, uh, uh, EHS, evolutionary human sciences paper. Uh, you know, we, we took the group identities to be given. Uh, we've, we've built into our, our framework the capacity for uh, endogenous group identity formation based on, you know, rewards that come from belonging to a group. Uh, and I think that that's, that's really important. And that allows group membership to shift and we can look at when are our endogenous identities stable and when are they able to be, to be shifted around. Um, something I haven't talked about, but I think is really important is the cultural transmission of packages that, that, that cultural ideas go together, right? That the, the idea of, uh, that, you know, your, your, your focus on purity and you're not liking vaccines that are based on mRNA, those things go together. Um, and I have a, a working paper, uh, where I've, I've tried to look at this formally, uh, looking, taking a, a price equation framework and, and expanding it to having cultural packages with covariances between the, 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 um, the different elements. And we think that this may be where we need to focus for interventions in these types of parochial learning environments. We have to try to break very strong covariances between traits. And I think that there's some, there's some, um, exciting work to be done there. The, uh, I, I don't have a slide for it. We, we also can easily build in this sort of Bayesian learning and, and the uncertainty that, that we can represent using these heavy tailed distributions. And our agents make decisions based on their, their updating, prior, uh, updating their priors and coming up with posteriors for, for making their decisions. And then last, and, and this is what we need all the money for, uh, we've got, we want to put people in the field and measure um, decision making under, under structural uncertainty. And, and this is not uh, necessarily epidemic stuff. This is actually, we're looking at fire uh, ecology in, in um, uh, the Sierra foothills and, and up in, on the North Coast. Um, but, you know, as I mentioned in the, in the, the introduction, you know, we see a lot of similarities uh, between thinking about how we manage pandemics and how we uh, manage things like existential th threats like climate change. So it all fits into the same package for me. So let's see, with that, I'll end. When in doubt, withhold tacos if people won't behave. That would get me to behave. I don't know about anyone else. But thank you for inviting me. Thanks for putting up with my te technological challenges here. I've never been that guy who's had a, a, a tech challenge. It's never happened in two years of, of, of Zooming. Bam. But anyways, thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Everyone, you can unmute, please, and give him a, a welcome for his great talk. <laughs> and uh, and I we have a a nice amount of time here now to uh, just field questions. Um, folks did put up their hands to, to thank Jamie for his talk. Um, if anyone would like to uh, raise their hand, um, then I'll be able to call on uh, folks who would like to raise an issue uh, prompted by Jamie's talk. All right, I don't see any coming in yet. Uh, there's so much to uh, discuss in, in terms of the theoretical space that you're uh, guiding us through and helping develop, Jamie. Um, and uh, there was a lot of points that uh, came across in various parts of your talk that 
you know, as a, as a human behavioral ecologist and, and as someone also interested in disease ecology um, struck me as, as having huge impl implications uh, for, the, for the way that work gets done uh, in these fields. And I do see hands coming up now. So I'll, I'll definitely follow those uh, hands as soon as I'm done asking my question. But I guess I'd, I, would, I would like to start uh, maybe towards the end of your talk where you mentioned uh, the importance of heterogeneous, heterogeneity among populations as, as you so nicely demonstrated with your model with Paul. Um, with a, with, with, in that case, you had created two groups and run through different contagion dynamics with the uh, parameters that you showed about um, aversion and susceptibility and uh, homophily and such. And then towards the very end, um, more grand scheme upscaling of the kinds of research that would be addressing um, how, for example, we could be simulating uh, the impact of uh, heterogeneous groups uh, and multi-group populations on um, uh, transmission dynamics. I'm just wondering um, if you could talk a little bit more about, you know, for example, how if, starting with a very simple model of a, of a you know, a population that contains several subpopulations, when you look at, you know, one of the most diverse places on earth, like California, uh, and, and you imagine not only are these dyadic interactions across groups, but these are incredibly more uh, complex interactions potentially uh, uh, within the state of California. Um, at that level, how do you scale up this kind of research? I mean, would you have um, in a perfect world, you know, armies of, of symbolic anthropologists going out and helping us decipher in-group in beliefs about their interaction with others or assessing risk preferences in a systematic way? And, and, and you know, I, I'm just wondering what, what do you see as, as a means to kind of scale up the central model, the, those, those simple and informative models to the reality of the diversity of a, of a place like California for, for a predictive science. Yeah, well, the answer to, should we send out an army of symbolic anthropologists? I think that we can all agree probably in this, in this, on this Zoom, that it depends on the type of symbolic anthropologist. If, if we're talking about people who are actually gonna measure some stuff um, and talk about things that matter in actual people's lives, absolutely. I, I would love yeah. to have an army of them out there. Um, yeah. And we're hoping to have a, a very small army go out and, and, and look at um, specifically these, these uh, the way people make decisions about, about existential threats. Um, the, the good news is that there's a lot of work in, in sociology and public health that, that integrates uh, heterogeneity in populations. And I, I, I think it's important to note, this may not be common knowledge to anyone who, who hasn't spent a lot of time with epidemic models. And honestly, it isn't apparently common knowledge with a lot of mathematical epidemiologists. Heterogeneity drives epidemics. So we, we can show quite easily but if you have heterogeneity and contact rates, so if you have different groups who have different rates of contact, your your reproduction number for the which is the the epidemic threshold, which determines the epidemic threshold, the reproduction number is number of, of secondary infection infections produced by a single typical case at the outset of an epidemic. So it's essentially the multiplicative growth ratio or of by generation early in the epidemic, uh, and for for an epidemic to take off, that has to be greater than one. The reproduction number is actually proportional to the variance in contact rate, right? The effective reproduction number is, is proportional to variance. So more variance in contact rates means higher R naught, means more likely epidemic, means more larger final size, means more difficulty control, controlling it. Um, and so, with armed with that understanding, there's been quite a bit of work uh, looking at particularly in the realm of sexually transmitted infections, uh, looking at, at how group structured interactions um, can affect these diffusion processes. Um, it's, I think it's harder to think about cultural identity, although, you know, at the, at the extremes, um, at the extremes, it's just like any other type of, of, of categorical difference. But I mean, we know that there are lots of non-extremes. And so thinking about other ways to 
um, to build in that heterogeneity, I think is, is pretty important. I, I don't know if that's a satisfying answer or not. No, I, I actually think you, you've touched on the importance of working with folks in sociology and public health who, who do this kind of work at a, at a larger scale than is traditional, at least within anthropology. But uh, yeah. yeah, that's, 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 that's a nice uh, discussion. So I'd like to now, uh, I don't know if Dan or, or Clark had their hand up first. I'll just call on Dan because he's in the upper left of my gallery. Hey, hi, Jamie. Thanks. Really interesting mm -hmm. stuff. Thanks. So I, I have I have two kind of comments slash questions. Um, and the first is maybe a, a, a mild plea for temperance, especially with regard to the early part of your presentation. So I, I think it's important to distinguish between um, differences in the beliefs that people hold with regard to an objective reality. So Objectively, there is a disease that is COVID-19. Uh, objectively, um, you know, mRNA vaccines do not contain microchips that track people. They don't change human genomes, right? Um, these are objective facts and people can be accurate or inaccurate in their beliefs about those. But not all of the social and cultural dynamics surrounding these behaviors stem solely from individuals either having beliefs that align with objective reality or not. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if you're looking at, you know, Orthodox communities in Israel, for example, where they've been, you know, as a, as a country, they've been enormously successful along many dimensions. Um, but uh, the contrast that occurs in that example, or, you know, many evangelical communities in the United States, between the prioritization on stopping disease transmission and the prioritization on the value of, you know, yeah. religious institutions and rituals, yeah. right? There, there is no, we, we can't say the right answer is, right? Um, and so these things matter because if the presentation, whether, you know, in your verbal presentation now or in the formalization in your models is there's a right and wrong and we know what the right is, you're going to miss all of those things that actually contribute to the conflagration, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and and um, so it's it, you know that's just a plea for temperance, and and I, I mean you can reject that, you can accept it, you can contest oh, it. Then I totally to accept that. I, I and actually you know if if I had shown my my unbelievably complicated tables about error management theory. Uh, which I cut out because it just would have taken too damn long to, to explain. Um, I mean, I do think that that you know people are are optimizing, and I can't get away from being a behavioral ecologist, right? They're optimizing multi-objective uh, optimization problems, yeah, right. And and frequently their their group identity and their their core beliefs come into conflict with, you know decisions uh, that, that have to be made in the world. And the where this becomes a problem is where those decisions are potentially existential and figuring out ways to um, to work with those sorts of things, uh, I think is is it's it's important to at least think about. And and I, I totally agree, you know, that um, yeah, so but you said you had two things. Okay, yeah. So the second one actually going to the latter part of your talk. Um, uh, which is that, uh, although you mentioned things like homophily, um, you, you, you're, you're addressing them, at least in the way that you presented the information today, primarily in terms of learning um, behavior yeah. and less in terms of assortment per se. Um, that is, you're just assuming that there is some marker that allows individuals to assort somehow, or there's network structure that's there for other reasons or whatever it is, right? Yes. Um, and and um, my point here is that not all behaviors are equal in their signaling value. Yeah, yeah. And and while it's certainly true that there are cultural packets, and so you know, mask wearing and vaccination are a cultural packet right now. They don't have equivalent signal value. Yeah. And and that suggests that at least at the margins, for example, there is there are leverage opportunities with regard to vaccination campaigns because absolutely. it is not a signaling behavior. No, absolutely. I mean, I think that there's very clearly a semiotics to mask wearing, right? And if you go back and and you read about, uh, you read the, so San Francisco was a hotbed of anti-mask activity in 1918, 
right? And and I think that there is really is there 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 are semiotics to mask wearing that that like it really bugs certain people, right? In in a, in a way that you know. So I I completely agree with you. I think that a lot of these things that seem to be packages. Uh, can be are actually more brittle than they they appear, uh, and that's that's exactly what we're trying to do in in pursuing recognizing that culture does tend to be transmitted and and accumulated in packages uh, is the way to think about how do you break apart the more brittle elements of those packages, the things that have lower covariances with the 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 core elements of of the culture. So this is absolutely right, right on on track to the way we're thinking about this. Good, good. Yeah. I mean, if you wanted to design a Sneetches with stars, Sneetches without, you know, mm -hmm. just from the abstract, you couldn't come up with a better star than a mask, right? Yeah, because we sure. tend to faces, you know, vocal expression is so important in our species, et cetera, yeah. right? I mean, it's a perfect storm for this. And 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 thinking about that with the recognition that culture does, you know, information comes in packets potentially I think is a is a an, an important component in your models. So yeah. I, I know that Clark was waiting also as I'll be quiet now. Thanks. Yeah, Clark. Hi Jamie. Um yeah, so I have I had two questions, but I'll just I'll just ask the first one because it's um closest to what you guys were just discussing. Um do you have an intuition of how the models would change if the goals of the agents were safety or signaling? For uh so, so what you're saying is, is when you say safety, that means like from the epidemic. Right, because I mean, there is evidence um, that, you know, I mean, the XKCD slide that you showed, but there's other evidence that, that a lot of people actually know what they should do. Um, and even know that the, that the pandemic is real and they know that the disease can be yeah. fatal or whatever. Um, and so you could imagine if you're interested in getting into psychological processes, you could partly differentiate the two, right? Yeah. Um, and ask, what does a pandemic look like when people are attempting to do some sort of signaling behavior versus what does it look like when they're yeah. trying to do, you know, save their lives? Yeah. And well, I mean, I, they're entangled. I mean, like, like Dan was saying, sure. you can't totally disentangle them, but if, since we're in modeling world and minimal models yeah. give you insight, right? You could uh, imagine separating those two goals in the agents and seeing what happens. Yeah, no, that's a great question, and I think that uh, it it gets at a, a, another thing that I, I didn't include. So we had a paper, um, former a uh, former grad student, current postdoc in the medical school here, uh, and a UCLA grad, um, geography grad. Um, uh, we we just had a paper come out in Plus Computational Biology, where we were looking at. Uh, epidemic models with with fear and behavior change driven by fear, and I think one of the really ironic features of of the COVID pandemic is the fact that it it doesn't induce the type of fear that something like Ebola does, right? And and you know there's a there's a core of truth to the talking point of the you know on, on whatever it is on on the, the anti public health side, right? That most people do survive. It is true, right? Yeah. The vast majority of people do survive, and many people don't have anyone in their local social networks who have have um, who've died, right? And so it doesn't seem to induce this sort of like strong fear reaction the way Ebola virus disease does. CDC, uh, in a paper by Meltzer et al. in in 2014, early on in the in the uh, West African Ebola outbreak um projected 1.4 million infections in west africa and you know in reality there were fewer than 30,000 and what's the problem they didn't put behavior change into their model and it turns out to be pretty hard to do in the sort of standard uh ordinary differential equation modeling framework um and it's even it gets even harder when you try to estimate estimate parameters from that um so, but what, what we did is we, we developed a model basically inspired by Ebola with fear and, and you, you reduce, you have an objective function uh, for, you, you know, that tells you your optimal number of, of social contacts that you have over a day. And that objective function is, is, is affected by the severity of mortality in your local environment. And uh, 
you know, the good news is it, it, we made a model. The bad news is it's really complicated behavior. It really depends on the parameter estimates. And we get, we get oscillations, you know, you, you, if there's a delay, you go outside, you're like, okay, things are looking all right. I'm going to go out and I'm going to start engaging in more interactions and then transmission increases. So you can get oscillations. And if the delay is long enough, you can actually drive that into a chaotic re regime. Um, wow. So that's a, a long-winded answer to say what I think might happen if there is prioritization of safety versus identity. If there's a prioritization of safety and the information isn't great and isn't sort of instantaneous, we're, there are always going to be cycles. Um, they may be minimal, but they're, they're, we're going to see cycling for sure. And cycling is hard, right? Because it makes it, it, makes it harder. I mean, we've seen, how many times have we seen it now where we're like, yes, we've finally beaten it. I keep like, I keep taking screenshots of, you know, some asshole I don't know on Facebook, you know, saying, it, I think it's clear that we're past this in, you know, March of 2020, they're living in Georgia. And I'm like, no, I don't think you're past it. Um, you know, and, and we keep, we keep like sort of misunderstanding the nature of epidemics that they come back <laughs> um yep. so yeah i think cycling will be a really important feature of of a, a model where there's much greater sensitivity to to safety um you know if people are, are going to prioritize identity and they're you can't completely separate you're going to saturate much faster you uh, but uh, and and but i mean it'll be it'll be much slower than a well-mixed model too so essentially if it, I, my prediction would be that if you if you maximize identity signaling, you're going to draw out the epidemic to the longest possible extent. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks. <laughs> I'm afraid it's not good news. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. Do, do we have any other questions? I mean, I had a second question. Oh, yeah. go ahead. Man. No, no, you you can go ahead. No, yeah, please, Clark, go ahead. Well, it's changing the topic, or it was focusing on a different aspect of the talk. I, 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 if nobody else does, I don't want to hog the floor, but I wanted to ask you about modeling uncertainty. Mm. So is this, um, you know, you showed your initial graph of it was just flat priors across all possible outcomes, which I think that's the way that some people have modeled it. I know there are some yeah. judgment decision-making models in psychology of this. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean, I guess my question is more, um, you know, how would you, the, one of the problems, as you know, with the rational choice frameworks, right, is that it doesn't build evolutionary dynamics in. So yep. of course, from the point of view of, an, of a, a rational agent, if there's complete uncertainty, you're, I mean, what are you going to do? Probably yeah. flat priors over every possible thing is the, is the best you could do. But then, um, then there's a, seems like there's a second question about whether if agents, you know, evolve, then from their point of view, there's uncertainty, but there's always um, the world will build, you know. They Selection have, builds in informative priors. That's right. right. I mean, they have, no, they, absolutely. have like, that, they have population memory of the world or something like that. I don't know. No, I, absolutely. That. That's, that's absolutely the case with, with, um, with evolutionary models. And, and I mean, uh, yeah, so I think that that's, that's super important. There are some really interesting uh, choice models that, that can incorporate uncertainty. And I think that they have really interesting articulations with psychological science, like, and, and I think they've been underdeveloped. Um, so there's, if, if, if anyone's seen this paper that Mike Price and I wrote last year, um, you know, we talk about this framework in, in economics called rank dependent expected utility theory. And it's a way of dealing with uncertain probability distributions where, and I actually think that the psychology works better, right? Like we don't, we don't go out and, and estimate probability density functions, right? But what we might do is, is recognize the difference between two probability density functions, their survivor functions, right? Essentially the complement of the cumulative distribution. We know, like we can, we can say, oh, I'm going to get a, a reward of at least T or greater, right? And that is better than this other decision, right? That, that has a lower probability of a reward T or greater. 
And that's the essence of rank dependent expected utility theory. And I think that there's actual psychology there. Yeah. Um, and so that would be another thing that, you know, we we're desperate to do some experiments on the theoretical predictions of our paper because they're super amenable to, to like decision yeah. experiments. And that um, connects a little bit to the to the Gigerenzer type of heuristics that you're talking about, right? Because those are those only work, the heuristics only work when there's environment structure. And then the magic is that there's some cue that tells you what the structure of the environment you're in is. And then yeah. you apply the heuristic and it's better than, than yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and evolution helps a lot. <laughs> yeah. Definitely, because, and so you would imagine that for, I mean, who knows, but for things like pandemics, perhaps one could imagine that there's some yeah. sort of um, built in idea of what the, tails you know that it's a fat we're in a fat tail world or something like that i mean yeah. who knows <laughs> maybe that's a bad uh, candidate actually but they're also i mean this is also where the fast and slow dynamics matter i think yeah. and yeah. that that's you know that's where the the sort of classical i mean i, I actually have it under my computer right rob and pete's book right i mean it they those models don't work well for for different different time scales interacting with each other right and yep. so and i think that that's really important for these types of questions yep yep great thank you uh dan your stand your your hand is still up would you care to yeah actually that that, that discussion kind of perfectly segues to where i was going to go so you know um uh, I mean, Jamie, you 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 um, you are a, a diplomatic ambassador among the three tribes of evolutionary anthropology, right? Between the well, behavioral ecologist, the evolutionary psychologist, and the cultural evolutionist. It's because I have no right? natal tribe. It's because I I got to choose as an as an adult, right? I'm a primatologist. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, but but I mean, um, your remarks with regard to the the kind of um, uh, Gigerenzian intersection of psychology um, uh, there speak, I think, volumes with regard to the, the need to take seriously um, uh, psychological evolutionary disequilibrium. So it's not a surprise that Ebola is so different than, than COVID in terms of people's responses to it, because, you know, seeing somebody hemorrhage from every orifice is a much more salient psychological stimulus than the idea that you're inhaling somebody else's used air, right? And, and that probably, I think, reflects the, the relative novelty of these kinds of zoonotic diseases that, um, that, that, you know, that require particular you know, population dynamics characteristic of modern life. Yeah, and I, so, you know, I don't if know you're, about that one, honestly, just because, I mean, and, and, and you know, just to sort of pick up on the salience here, I think, and, and, and I mean, obviously, we've got lots of privacy concerns. I feel like if we showed more of these horrifying images, right, of, from these emergency departments and, and that sort of thing, there would have been much greater salience to people taking this seriously. Those images are, are like seeing someone hemorrhaging, right? And, and, and we have you know, there, there are lots of respiratory illnesses that are zoonotic that, that happen in, you know, more rural, you know, uh, forest adjacent populations. I, I, I don't, I mean. Sure, but they never become the kind of, you know, wide scale selective pressure, right, that, um, that, that, uh, that we're seeing right now. And, and I, I'll just, you know, I'll counter, there have been plenty of people who, you know, through, you know, physicians and providers who through intuition have arrived at the idea that if people just saw what was happening in the ICU, then they changed their behavior. That yeah. information is out there and yeah. contrast this with, you know, the response to September 11th, right? Yeah. Um, you know, you, you didn't actually have to see very many bloody bodies after September 11th for, for the entire country to change, right? Yeah. Um, uh, I, I think the idea that you're, you're breathing in somebody else's exhalation, mm. it's just not, uh, you know, part of our evolved psychology as a salient stimulus. Mm. And, and as long as you adopt the kind of, you know, quasi behavioral ecology perspective that, you know, people will make smart decisions given you know, the information environment, you ignore that legacy. And, and I think the potential to influence behavior is handicapped by that. Mm. 
That's interesting. I'll, I'll have to think about that. Um, yeah, that's a uh, it's a, a a nice intersection of theory as well of you know applied intuitive public health to bring into this. You know, in, in terms of pulling the effective levers, um, I, it seemed to me at least that your 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 presentation of that case was um, illustrative that assuming even high degrees of decision making um, um, and uh, optimization, you would still come out to these aggregate incomes. Doesn't, doesn't rule out the possibility things could get even worse when you throw in sensory biases and effective oh, yeah. you know, structure to it. So, No, I mean, uh, that's the thing is I think things could be a whole lot worse. Yeah. Um, that it, there are many ways in which we've gotten really lucky with COVID because we've made so many terrible decisions. Um, Obviously, you know, lots of people didn't get lucky, though. Right. So I, uh, I will say that it's 1.30 now. And, uh, and so I just want to say again, perhaps folks can unmute themselves if they haven't already and, and say thanks again to Jamie for visiting us from the north. Hopefully, and I wish I could have come for I Rio. Know. I know, of course. Uh, I'm actually yeah. flying down to SoCal tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> Despite to go to see a water polo game down in, in La Jolla. Yeah. I was yeah, going to so drive right. down from, from UCLA, but I, you know, now I got to fly. Yeah. Uncertainty. What can I say? We didn't yeah. even know what the parameters were. So no, totally. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, okay. Well, um, so thanks again, Jamie. And uh, it's, it's great to connect with you always and to yeah, hear cool. your, your work and good luck with your grant proposals. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. All that's right. important. Thanks for everyone coming. All right. All right. All right. See everyone next week. Stay safe. Stay well. Stay Jamie, uh, Jamie, do you want to, do you want, do you want to uh, meet at some point? Yeah, yeah, that would be great. Um, should I just shoot you an email and we can figure out a time? Yeah, is there is there a time tomorrow? Yeah, um, I could do. Uh, I'm actually I need to drive to campus and get there by twelve thirty. So pre pretty much any time before eleven, like nine to a window yeah. between nine and eleven would work. Anytime. That's great. Morning's wide open for me tomorrow. Okay. Do you want to do? Uh, let's say um, is nine or ten. Um, yeah, nine's great. Nine. Whatever. Let's do nine. All Let's right. do nine. That'll give us some extra. Yeah, wiggle room. All right. Um, I'll send you. I'll send you an email that has my Zoom link. We could just okay. use that if you want. All right. Sounds good. Yeah, that's cool. great. Thanks, Glenn. All right. Good to Look see you. To All right. I'll see you tomorrow at nine. Yep. All right, Brian. Adios, man. <laughs>